Okay, so now let's take some of the ideas we've been developing and combine them into understanding some of the questions about why the instrument vendors such as Thermo Fisher Scientific do things the way we do, the offerings we make that uh, allow you to do Raman spectroscopy. Again, as I said, we would be seeing this energy level again and again and again, and here it is again, okay? The ground state, remember, our V equals zero. I'll start on this side this time. One, two. Then we're going to have, remember when we talked about fluorescence, we said it's actually gonna go up to a real level. So let's put that, put a levels up here. So this is now E equals one. This is gonna be the ground E, sorry about that, E equals zero. So this is the ground electronic, first electronic, ground vibrational state there. And then we can put some virtual states in the middle in a minute. But what I wanna get at is this. If we take our laser, and um, when I was doing Raman spectroscopy, uh, when I first started doing Raman spectroscopy, the laser we used was an argon ion laser, a great big thing. It looked like a photon cannon. It was a great thing to have in the lab, uh, good laser to have in the lab. And it emitted light at 514 nanometers in the green and 488 in the blue. Now, at 488 in the blue, that's a fairly high energy. Blue is high energy, right? Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, as you go up in energy. Red being lowest, violet being highest. So the energy's going up. So blue is a relatively high energy laser. If you took that blue laser and struck a molecule with it, you might have enough energy to boost it up into this electronic excited state, and then you're gonna end up with fluorescence. Remember, it's gonna fall down in here until it gets back to the ground state, and then it's going to emit a photon from that excited state, getting back to the ground state. And this is going to be a fluorescence, and I'll put a big F on it as fluorescence. That's a fluorescence photon. Okay, well, think about it just a moment, and, and the first idea of how to avoid fluorescence is immediately obvious. What if the laser doesn't have enough energy to get you up to that excited state? If the laser is, sh is uh, lower in energy such that I end up here instead of here, the molecule's not gonna fluoresce. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, and we'll use a different color here. We'll use green because it's a little lower in energy than blue. We'll take a green laser and we'll only go that far will come up short of the fluorescent level. And now we're in that virtual state that we were talking about earlier. Once we're in that virtual state, we now end up with a Raman scatter that comes back down. And you can see what we've done is avoided fluorescence by not pumping the molecule up enough to get it into the excited state. If it doesn't get there, it's not gonna fluoresce. So this is why if you look at the list of lasers that are supplied by many of the vendors, they may have some high energy ones, like 455, which is way up, um, well, as I said, 488 is blue. This is headed to the violet. It's a bright blue, okay? But they will also offer things like 532. That's a pretty standard diode laser. Used to be a frequency doubled neodymium YAG at 1064, but the, the 532 laser, good one, green, but it may still be too much for the molecules. One really nice one is at 785, because remember, as the nanometers goes up, as the nanometers get longer, the wavelength is getting longer of those lasers, the energy is going down. So if you imagine that might be 455, 532, 785 would only come up to there. This all sounds really good. In other words, why don't we all just use 785 and be done with it? Bradley's first rule of spectroscopy, you never get something for nothing. Herein lies one of the key compromises that has to be made in Roman spectroscopy. And that is the fact that the efficiency is proportional to one over 
the wavelength of that laser raised to the fourth power, the fourth power. As the laser wavelength gets longer, the Raman efficiency plummets. You see the trade-off. With fluorescence, you want that long wavelength because you won't fluoresce. But your efficiency, the Raman scattering cross-section, or the Raman scatter that actually gets the detector, becomes abysmal, it becomes anemic as you get to these longer wavelengths. It depends upon the molecule that you're looking at. Another laser that's used, and I'll explain why in just a few minutes when we look at FT Roland, is 1064. 1064 is ginormous. The efficiency is going to plummet, and there are times when you use a 1064 laser and don't see anything. You use 532 and you get these big peaks. So you see now there's the trade-off. This is why more than one laser is offered. You would think if avoiding fluorescence is all that mattered, use 785 or 1064, you're done. But the one over lambda to the fourth says you don't see anything. Oh, well, then we need a shorter wavelength laser, 455. Ah, but the fluorescence eats your lunch. There's a trade-off that has to be made, and this is why, as a vendor and as a user, you have to figure out how to balance these two, which lasers to buy. And this is why, on a system such as the thermoscientific DXR microscope, F Raman microscope, or smart Raman, or the imaging microscope, you have the ability to easily interchange lasers. You can swap them in and out instead of just being stuck with one the whole time. Because there may be some systems where 455, mm, it works brilliantly, and there are other cases where it doesn't work at all. There are a lot of other lasers you can stick in here, like the helium neon at 633. I mentioned the argon at 514 and 488. There are all kinds of lasers, and if you, again, go to an analytical trade show, and you go to some of these dealers who have the, um, the banks of diode lasers, you'll see color after color after color. They have so many. And the reason why has to do with this trade-off. Fluorescence, bad. Efficiency, bad. you got to find that balance. Okay? So this is why they're there. This is what we'll be talking about when we get to the instrumentation as far as the easy interchangeability of those lasers go. Okay, so now we're going to take a step back and we're going to look at this particular laser, which is used in a special type of system called an FT-Raman, uh, and look at why and then look at how that's done.